Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Jennifer Lavasser, a curator here at the National Air and Space Museum, and I have the fortune of being the curator for the Space Shuttle Discovery. I want to welcome you all today to the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center here in Chantilly, Virginia. And for our program today, I will do a brief introduction just to say that 10 years ago, in April of 2012, I was here in the same building and I had a number of astronaut guests with me uh, who helped escort Discovery into this building. And one of those astronauts is here with us today. Colonel Eileen Collins recently published her memoir and today we'll hear about her journey from growing up in New York to becoming an Air Force pilot to becoming an astronaut and two-time pilot, two-time commander of space shuttle missions. Please join me in welcoming astronaut Eileen Collins and her co-author, Jonathan Ward. So I'll start off with a few questions and I think uh, we'll I'll have some audience questions along the way. I encourage you all to contribute your questions using the QR codes. Um, but I'll kick it off and this came up a little bit while we were having lunch a little while ago. At what stage did you know you wanted to write a book and how did you go about thinking about how to do it? Do you want to start? Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Eileen and I, I had the opportunity to work together on my previous book, which was called Bringing Columbia Home about the Space Shuttle Columbia accident. Eileen, as the return to flight commander after the Columbia accident, wrote the epilogue to that book. And when I found out after we finished that book that she had not written her memoir as I was on Eileen's case for quite a while to make sure that somebody wrote her memoir as whether I got involved with it or not. And then um, COVID happened and suddenly our schedules freed up and I got a phone call from Eileen late in April of 2020 and she said, are you still interested in working on the book together? And so that's how it came about. We, worked, we did it entirely virtually by phone and by email and by exchanging uh, exchanging documents over the course of the next year. Awesome. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that is I, I never wanted to write a book because I, I don't want to write about me, you know, <laughs> but I, I like to read a lot. So one of my hobbies is reading. And when I was a child, I read books about pilots. And one of them, you know, Amelia Earhart, Jackie Cochran, um, military pilots, I could go on and on. And it really was what made me decide to become a pilot and an astronaut was reading books. So I think that was, you know, to, to add, you know, everything Jonathan said was exactly correct. We were getting a little bit bored during the lockdown and <laughs> the pandemic and had some free time. So I, I'm so glad that we did it. So you mentioned that there's just so much to talk about. You know, obviously, we all have lifelong stories. Jonathan, how do you think about finding the right way to edit that into a book? Well, it was an interesting uh, story. You know, first of all, I remember when I, I mentioned this to Eileen, she said, well, I, all the astronaut biographies uh, start off with, I was a, a gifted child and then I got better. <laughs> and, or, <laughs> or, and, uh, you know, but Eileen said, my story's a little different than that. And I knew about her work a, a, as a space shuttle astronaut, but I knew nothing about her military career. And I knew obviously nothing about her childhood. And so, um, you know, we agreed that I would provide some of the, the fundamental research on the space shuttle uh, things, which were, which were available information through the archives, but it, a lot of it came about through doing interviews with, with Eileen, and you know, we, we kind of did a, an outline. We put together the, the opening chapter, which is what it, what it was like to launch into space, and then just decided to start telling the story, and it just evolved as we went along. Yeah, and the book would not have happened without Jonathan. <laughs> I, I, did, I mean, he kept me on schedule, and you know, I think you know, we, worked, we were a great team working together on meeting the schedule and you know, kind of meeting like, the mission statement that we had set out for ourselves. I can say as an author myself, that's definitely something that's incredibly helpful to have is somebody kind of pushing you to finish your book. I want to ask you a little bit, you mentioned um, reading stories about aviation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your local library played a role and sort of your local community played a role in shaping your interests? I mean, you live near an airfield. What were the things that were around you that sort of inspired you to think about becoming a pilot? Uh, so upstate New York has quite a history in aviation, a lot of people aren't aware, but my hometown of Elmira, New York is the location of the National Soaring Museum and we have a glider field at Harris Hill. I went to summer camp there, I used to watch the gliders fly overhead. Um, Glenn Curtis had his factory up there in the Finger Lakes. And uh, the, But having said that, I know that was part of my, my inspiration to fly. My mother took us to the library 
part of it was get the kids out of the house. You know, <laughs> it, it was cold up there in the winter, and I have a place to go. But I came back from the library with a stack of books. And I was a little kid. I loved animals, horses, dogs, bugs. I mean, it, it was kind of crazy, the books I checked out. But as I got older, I found this section on aviation. And I had mentioned earlier some of the people that I read about. But there were some of, I mean, the titles of the books would grab my attention. Fate is the Hunter. I mean, how can you not read that book? <laughs> and God is my co-pilot, The Stars at Noon. So those are some of the books that I read in, in, as a teenager. And then I started reading What Makes an Airplane Fly. And I read a book on how the C-5 was designed in the Air Force's history and things like that. And I found that this was, for whatever reason, it was something that inspired me and made me want to study math and engineering. Um, you mentioned, uh, in particular, as a young child, going to a summer camp. Um, yes. Did you did you learn things about, in particular, leadership at that at that uh, and through that experience, or sort of where did your sense of being a leader come from? Yeah. So I was the second of four children. As some people say, you know, sometimes the order of your childhood makes a difference in the kind of person. You know, there probably is something to that. But I will say I am a big fan of summer camps. I think they're very good for kids. Whatever they go off and do, whatever. I went to outdoor camps, you know, where we, you know, we're swimming, recreation, hiking, things like that. But you do have that interaction with other kids, and you have an opportunity. They give you a chance at leadership, and you're away from your parents. I, I, mean, I love my parents. They were my great role models. But it's good when you're, you know, maybe 10, 12, 14 years old to get to learn some independence, get away, and I uh, sent my kids to summer camp also for the same <laughs> reason, because how, it, you know, it's hard to really articulate it, because it, I don't think it really matters if you go to, what kind of camp you go to, if it's technical and maybe a computer camp, or a space camp, or a YMCA scouting type camp, I think it's just, it, it, it actually also helped me prepare for the military. In the overnight camps, they come in and they check our cabins and make sure that we kept them clean. Now, Jonathan, you mentioned uh, knowing about Eileen's youth. You didn't, it wasn't the same story you'd seen in every other astronaut memoir. And I have to agree with you, this is yeah. a very different, you have a much different story, and I think it's very identifiable um, for a lot of people who may not expect it. So you, you, you talk a little, you talk quite a bit actually about your youth and, and sort of the family struggles that your, your family had um, going through things like hurricanes and floods and all kinds of, not only natural disasters, but just sort of, yeah. you know, difficulties. What would you, what kind of advice or thoughts would you give to not only children, but parents on how to kind of work their way through those kinds of, uh, those kinds of difficulties um, to kind of then Except become successful too? You know, Jonathan might want to say something on this also, because I know he, he's a, uh, he also does coaching and leadership and things like that. But I would say no parents are perfect, and parents should not be perfect. I think they just need to love their kids, you know, through the imperfections. And my parents had their own struggles with different things going on in their life. I wrote about in the book. But my parents would always, you know, they, they would always try, and they'd say, we love you. And I think that's really what mattered. And they were able to talk to me about what they were dealing with. And I think that really gave me an understanding of human nature, even as a kid. And I think kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. I think they really have like a resiliency and an understanding that maybe we don't give them credit for. And so I grew up, I would say, pretty fast, you know, with the family struggles. But but it was it was not all bad and I don't want you know no one should feel sorry for you because everybody has some kind of struggles that they deal with I don't know if you want to add anything no, to I that. just one of the things that really impressed me about Eileen's story is that she did have a lot of hardship growing up uh, you'll read about it in the book that that her parents were separated her father didn't live in town her mother had a uh, had a, a nervous issue and ended up having to be institutionalized while Eileen was a senior in high school she ended up raising or taking care of the house for her and her two younger siblings for several months while her mother was institutionalized. Eileen became the parent of the house while she was still a senior in high school. Yeah. It would be very easy for some people to say, you know, my parents damaged me, my parents were horrible, look at all the pain and suffering they caused me. Eileen turned it into a positive experience and 
I think you know the fact that she dedicated the book to the to her parents uh, says a lot for how you go about framing those kinds of things in a way rather than being a victim. This is where it helped me be stronger as a, as a person and. The love that she had for for them comes through loud and strong, and you know, I think we've probably spent more time writing that opening chapter than we did any other part of the book. Yeah. So you moved on from um, being a, a young person in New York to going on and um, going off to college, community college first, and then on to Syracuse. Then it was on to the Air Force. You spent 26 years in the Air Force. Did you ever have a, do you have a favorite aircraft to fly from all of those years? <laughs> <laughs> now that's not an aircraft, but pretty close. <laughs> it was the last time she flew it. it was, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I will say, so I was in basic training boot camp with the Air Force and they took us out to the A-7. So the Air Force was flying A-7s. It was Rickenbacker Air Force Base in Ohio. And we got to sit in the cockpit of the A-7. And I, it was the, one of the coolest things I'd ever done. And I remember the maintenance technician that was there was made sure the seat is pinned so you don't eject yourself out of the, out of the plane. But I sat in there and I looked at, this plane had flown in Vietnam and I was looking at all the switches and the dials and it was dirty, it smelled like fuel. And I go, this is what I want to do. So uh, very, the, the Air Force presented just the greatest opportunities to, you know, I mean, do the thing I love, which is flying, but also, you know, serve. And it sounds corny to say, go out and be all you can be. But I mean, you really, the, the challenge is you push yourself beyond what you think you could ever possibly do. And you pushed yourself in, in Air Force uh, test pilot school and uh, throughout your career, often being the only woman in the room or the leader of the people in the room. Um, do you have any advice for young people who are also feeling sort of that they have to blaze their own trail, that they're, they're sort of the first, especially we find a lot, the first to do something out of their family? Yeah, you, you know, that, that is a very important question because whatever you decide to do, I believe you need to set a mission for yourself. And so when I went to Air Force pilot training, I was in the first class of women to ever go through pilot training there, and there were four of us. And the mission I set for myself was be the best pilot you can be. I'm not going to try to change the culture. I'm not going to try to you know, just, you know, go off on doing something outside of my mission. Just be the best pilot you can be and stay focused. So whatever you decide to do, I think really staying focused on that mission for yourself and keep coming back to that. And, and you can see it today, like we're distracted. Like I pull out my phone because there is one specific email that I need to check for, but what happens? I'm hit with all these messages from ESPN and, you know, like <laughs> football game this weekend. I'm like, oh yeah, and so I'm distracted. So you got to try that's just an example of what happens today but even back in the old days there were constant distractions being in the first class of women people wanted us to do things that didn't have to do with the mission you just have to say no why am i here stick to the reason that you came there for in the first place I'm going to take one of the questions from one of our uh, viewers who's from Alexandria, Virginia, who asked something very relevant to this uh, topic. Uh, have you ever had a particularly dangerous mission as a pilot? Or one that gave you reason to uh, think about not panicking? <laughs> well, the first one that comes to mind is the mission into Grenada. So mm -hmm. this was back in 1983. I was flying the C-141. I, I, we were actually deployed. This, this was horrible, but if you remember in 1983, there was an attack in the Marine barracks in Beirut, and we lost a lot of our Marines in that terrible accident. Well, accident was an attack. We were deployed out of California to pick up Marines in Cherry Point and take them over to Beirut. So I talk about that a little bit in the book. It didn't happen as planned, but on the way back, we stopped at the command post in Dover, Delaware, and we were told the United States just invaded Grenada. We're like, where's that? <laughs> so we actually went down to Grenada. We took the 82nd Airborne down there. We had no fighter escort. At the time, the airfield, we didn't know that it was, by the time we got there, the airfield was secure, but we didn't know that. So we knew we were flying into a combat zone without the, what I would hope to have as, an, as some kind of escort or some kind of defense. So that was, I think, one mission I went into kind of, oh, you know, this, you know, this could be bad. 
but it turned out to be just fine because the crews that went in just ahead of us, they did their job and they secured the airfield. So we talk about that in the book. Yeah, one of the things that's important to point about with, with, the, with the context of that was that women were not allowed to fly combat aircraft at that time. And so it, it, the idea with, with Eileen flying a, a, um, a cargo plane was because she could not fly a fighter, which she really wanted to do. And so women were supposed to stay away from combat. But at that point, once war is declared like that, the rules go out the, out the window. Yep. So she got combat pay yep. and a combat medal, even though women were not allowed to do that. <laughs> So uh, following that period into the late 80s, you're, you mentioned in the book you're thinking about uh, something that you had thought about as a child, which is becoming an astronaut. And we have a really appropriate question here. Um, if a high school student today would be interested in becoming an astronaut, what kind of courses would you recommend? And how might they make themselves a viable candidate? to be an astronaut. Yes, so it is required. So if you if you want to be a NASA astronaut, so now we also have commercial astronauts today and that that's going to be a lot happening in the future, but for the for the NASA professional astronaut, you must have a degree in math, science or engineering, STEM basically. And there are some caveats in there like technology degrees are not uh, allowed. So you'd have to go USA jobs and look at the requirements. So I would do that first of all, and as far as courses, for the shuttle era, engineering was really important. I would say electrical engineering was, was important if, if you wanted to be a very like useful crew member that could repair things, et cetera. But it, it's going to be different in the future. We're going back to the moon, as you all know, and eventually go to Mars. So if you have a degree in geology, that will be needed. Now, you don't want all of your astronauts to be geologists. You've got to have a variety out there. So I always tell young people, don't just do something because I need that degree because that's going to get me X, Y, Z. You want to major in something that you enjoy, that you like doing. We are, I think it will also help to have a language. And so today we cooperate with Russia. Who knows where that's going in the future, but having some Russian language. But we also cooperate with France, Italy, uh, you know, really the Spanish-speaking nations not as much, but having a language like that is, Japan, Jap I should mention Japanese because we, they are a big part of our program in Canada. Um, can can Canada, they speak French and English. So I would say having a language, having maybe a scuba certification or having a private pilot's license will make you stand out. But the key point is having the degree, and now they require a master's degree that was just changed in some type of engineering. And I would say the ideal astronaut would have two degrees in different fields. It's, that's asking for a lot, but <laughs> so it's, it's competitive. Yeah, most certainly. And I think you mentioned in the book that you were one of 2,000 applicants when you applied um, and were selected finally in 1990. Um, the astronaut corps had already begun to change, um, beginning with the first selection in 1978. It included women and people of color. Did you notice similar changes, at least maybe in the culture of the astronaut corps or in the sort of who you were working with that may have been different than what you saw when you were inspired originally to become an astronaut? Well, th well, that's true. So I initially decided to be an a I wanted to be an astronaut back during the Gemini program, which was in the 1960s, and there weren't any women astronauts back then. Um, but I still, I thought I'll just be a lady astronaut. You know, that's <laughs> what I wanted to do. But you know, as far as the as far as the culture, I will say the working the working culture at NASA was light years ahead of the military. So the the military, because the Air Force was founded in 1947. Okay, in like the Army and Navy, like way you know hundreds of years ago and then NASA 1958. So I think NASA had maybe a younger culture and when the women came in in 1978, you know, th th it wasn't perfect, but I think that the women were more accepted because of the mission they were going to be doing and they were extremely competent. Uh, the mission specialists that came before me, they really greased the skids, they made it easy <laughs> for me when I came in. And there were also women mission controllers working in, uh, in Houston Mission Control before the women astronauts came in. They were doing a great job too. So, you know, I gotta hand it to the, the gals that went before me. So I ask this question of almost every astronaut who comes to visit us. Uh, you were selected in 1990. Each class of astronauts always has a nickname. Can you tell us why your class oh. was nicknamed <laughs> the Hairballs? Okay, so I was, I, I will not take credit for that name, but um, we had, so the classes before us, had started naming themselves. So we felt like, well, we should pick a name. 
we were group 13. So we designed a patch with a black cat on it. And one of the senior astronauts, Kathy Sullivan, actually said, oh, yeah, that's not going to get approved. When we had STS-13 years before that, headquarters disapproved the black cat. <laughs> they, you can't have a black cat. It's too unlucky or for whatever reason, too unprofessional. So they were not allowed to have the black cat. So we decided to make two patches. We had the, the patch, the hairball patch, which is the black cat, and then we did the, the professional one that NASA funded with the space station, the moon, and Mars. But we had to pay for the one with the cat on it. <laughs> so we hear, obviously, Eileen's voice in the book. This is her story. But Jonathan, I want to ask you, how much research were you doing on, say, this initial period uh, about you know, her work at NASA, her, her ex uh, acceptance into the astronaut corps? How much sort of additional work do you do as a researcher to kind of fill in some gaps? Well, it was, it was uh, very nice that a lot of the people that she worked with were people that I had met through writing uh, the Columbia book. And so I, you know, for example, interviewed her uh, first commander, Jim Weatherby, who was very instrumental in the Columbia recovery mission. And he was uh, Eileen's first commander. And, you know, it started off with, he, was, he, was, he said, I will start off by saying that Eileen is the most mission focused, steady, steely eyed person you can possibly imagine. And she is also the nicest person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and so that was the kind of stories that I got to hear by talking to people. Uh, I knew Tom Jones, who was one of her classmates and so he gave me some um, stories about things behind the scenes. And Eileen uh, graciously gave me access to some of the people from her military days and got to do some research from that standpoint. And so yeah, we, we present the story as Eileen said it, but I also try to temper it with what other people said about what was going well, on. Well, I will too. say the book would not have been done at all, but it certainly would have been done on time without Jonathan. Because he's <laughs> Eileen worked, hit up against a deadline here. So he was like the foundation of writing the four chapters on the four missions. You know, that, that was a huge time sink, I would say. It took a lot of time to get those chapters right. There's a lot of technical detail in there about some of the malfunctions that we had, which Jonathan researched all those and wrote them all down. And I said, check, check, that's right, that's right, that's right. It all happened. Everything in the book is true. We, we, well, we did make some mistakes, though. We corrected them in the second We did, edition. that's right. Well, you know, it, part of the mission for the, for the book was Eileen wanted to tell her story. She wanted it to be an inspirational story for people. But at the same time, we recognized that there's not a lot of history about the space shuttle era out there. And so we wanted to make sure that this was going to be valuable as a historical document as well. So we, we were very meticulous about making sure we double-checked everything that went in there. And uh, we were forced to do, all because this was in the middle of COVID, we were writing this, we were forced to do all of the research online through the National Archives or through uh, NASA websites or from other, other people that had documents from there. But we weren't able to go on, uh, we, we would have loved to go to the archives at Johnson Space Center, but we couldn't do that at well, all. Well, you know, we didn't even see each other until after the book was submitted, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. I think yeah. it was in printing when we saw each other yeah. since so we signed the contract. We are sitting here underneath an incredible vehicle. Um, we're going to talk a little, now, I think uh, you gave me a great intro to uh, what we want to talk about next, which is, Eileen, your selection as a pilot astronaut uh, aboard Discovery STS-63. Um, this is a monumental moment. No woman previously had piloted a space shuttle. Um, how did you feel about that? <laughs> Frankly, were you terrified? Were you um, excited? I, I would imagine it's a mix of emotions. Yeah, you know, so I used to tell people, I don't have any feelings. I don't have any emotions. You know, it, if you get too terrified or too excited or whatever, it, I think that distracts you from your mission also. So I tried to cut out a lot of these external things that were going on. There was one that I couldn't cut out, which my pilot friends back in the Air Force and on the civilian side, Eileen, do it for us. <laughs> Show us that women can do it. And they'd be like, oh, oh, I better not make a mistake. So, I mean, there was a little bit of that pressure, but I would say you can't let the external environment throw you off kilter. So it's so important to just, as we used to say, laser focused. I know that word's overused, but just stay so focused on what you're doing. For example, the launch itself, you've got to be paying attention to, for the pilot, uh, during the launch, the engines, the auxiliary power units, hydraulics, fuel cells, electrical systems. You've got to be, in, and there are many cases where you're throwing switches, like we had to close these external uh, tank doors 
Uh, we had to uh, shut down APUs. We had to uh, tie some electrical buses together. And you can't be thinking about, oh, here I am I'm in space. You've got to be thinking, what, what's next? Doing everything in the right order, staying focused and paying attention also to what is my crew doing? Are they staying on schedule? Are we working together? So I would say you got to cut out the, and the only time that we really interacted with the outside press, the journalists, was the scheduled, the regularly scheduled, uh, we called them press events, where we would meet with the press and we didn't do anything extra. So, I mean, that can wait till after the mission. C could I so jump in real, real quick here? Yeah, I, one of the things that I really liked about working with Eileen was, for those of us, who, I don't know if, how many of you have ever met astronauts before, but especially having talked to some of the Apollo astronauts, the question they get is like, what, what did it feel like walking on the moon? <laughs> And they'll say, like, I don't know what it felt like. I was so busy. I was so focused on what I was doing. I, I wasn't focusing on my emotion. And I kept trying to, trying to pry that out of Eileen as I was talking to her. And what was, I think was, was the real story that kind of tells this, there's a, a story about when she got called to the White House when they were going to make the announcement that she was going to be the first <laughs> woman commander. Yeah. And she went in and met with President Clinton and, and Mrs. Clinton and was going to go into the Roosevelt Room for the press announcement. And she said she looked in the door and she just completely froze and she said, for the second time in my life, I had a panic attack. Yeah, and only twice in my life. And yeah. it was like, it starts here and it goes whoosh. Mm -hmm. It's like a but, but, interesting but, phys physical experience. I'm like, I'm not going in there. But, <laughs> I am not going in there. I'm nope. But, but, I you, <laughs> but, but you drew the distinction. You said, like, Eileen, Eileen, the person can't do this, but the shuttle commander can do this. And yeah. so she kind of made herself the shuttle commander and walked in the door with the president. And so, you know, assuming this role and moving in there makes it... Yeah, yeah, know. and that's a great technique to use in life. You know, sometimes you just jump in. So I kind of have two different roles. Like right now I'm in the astronaut role, but when I get on the plane or I go home and I'm with my family, I'm in the Eileen role. <laughs> so I try to keep them separate because you, you have to stay humble. I watch some people that they let it go to their head and, and that's that can send you off in the wrong direction. You've got to... It's so important to maintain your humility because if you don't do that, you're not going to be thinking straight. You're not going to be thinking about the mission and what's really important. I want to get to some of the questions that we normally get from our audience, which are incredibly important, and they are really about living in space. That's a great, uh, a great thing to move into. But I do want to mention um, briefly, I want to have you tell us a little bit about some very special guests were, that were at the STS-63 launch. Um, there was a, a group of women in particular that were invited to that launch that I think uh, our audience may not know about. Or maybe they've heard of them but don't really know the story. Right, so now called the Mercury 13, the 13 women who went through the Mercury, the, you remember the original Mercury 7 astronauts. So they had to go through all these crazy medical tests. Well, out at the Loveless Clinic in it was in New Mexico. New Mexico. Dr. Lovelace wanted to see how the women would, on his own, this was not like NASA didn't ask for that, how would the women do in these tests? And so they tested well more than 13, I can't remember the exact number, but 13 of them passed all the required number of tests. And they went on and did an, a second bank of tests. Well, they had never all met each other. And to make a long story short, they were getting together to, you can see, you've got the photo up here, they were getting together to do a movie. Well, they called themselves the Flats, uh, which was the first lady astronaut trainees, mm -hmm. I believe is what, is what they called themselves. But that name kind of went away and they became the Mercury 13. Well, I met them when they were starting to do their movie up in Oklahoma City, and I said, would you like to come to my first space launch? <laughs> and so they came, and by the way, I invited them to all four of my launches. And as the years went by, you know, we were losing them. They, you know, weren't all surviving up to the point of my last flight. But a good number of them came to all my missions, and NASA really got their story out there. And, it, and there's many books now that have been written on the Mercury 13 women. And, you know, what an uh, incredible group of women that could have been our first women astronauts. But the timing just wasn't, the, the, the country just wasn't ready yet. And NASA was mandating that their astronauts be test pilots, and the women did not have the opportunity to go through military test pilot school because the women weren't allowed to fly in the military back in those days. So um, that's, that's pretty much the story in a nutshell, and uh, I must say that we thank those women for what they did. They proved that women physiologically could handle 
the rigors of space flight. And if it wasn't for them, who knows, it would have taken longer to get NASA, to get women in the program. And so during your launch on STS-63, you're really proving, you know, that this can be uh, a job, uh, piloting can be a job for women. Um, you, you describe it very, um, I think very, it's a very visual description. It's a very, you know, you kind of feel it in the first chapter of the book, this whole process of getting into space. Once you get there, I know we get this question and Jonathan brought it up, what does it feel like to be there? What's your body's reaction to that environment? Because that's one of the things that I think we struggle, obviously, uh, the rest of us, um, there's only been about, what, 600 people who have ever gone to space. We're coming up to that number, I think. What, what's the body's sort of initial reaction? Because I think the reaction you described as sort of the first few days is maybe something that people are familiar with but might not expect. Yeah, well, you know, the first is, of course, you're going through a 3G load on the launch itself. At about 8 minutes and 20 seconds, the main engine's cut off. At that point in time, you're accelerating at 3G, so three times your normal weight. It, it, for example, if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, if you could stand on a weight scale during the launch, it would register 300 pounds. So it's at the force that you're under. Well, when the engine's cut off, you immediately go to zero G. You don't get thrown forward because that would be a negative G. So everything immediately goes to zero. And your neck ring floats up, your helmet floats, your checklist, which is tied to your leg, the pages start floating, they fan out, and you can see the dust, especially at night, you get these lights shining, you can see these dust particles everywhere, it all just, <laughs> and anything that anyone left in the flight deck, that's gonna start floating. But uh, I'll, I'll just tell a quick story, this is in the book, so some of you may have read this. I'm busy doing my switches, and I mentioned before all the duties that I have. And Mike Full, my flight engineer, said, Eileen, stop working so hard. Look out the window. There's your first sunrise from space. Look out. You. And I looked out, and I, you could see the, the Earth was black. Okay, and then you could see, like, the rainbow, which was the curvature of the Earth. And the colors, it's like yellow, orange, red, some blue in there. And I'm like, the Earth is round. Oh my gosh. So that was my thought. Like the Earth is round because all my life been in an airplane looking at a flat horizon, and now I'm looking at a curve. And I go, I now I'm distracted, Mike. That was not what I needed. So, but you know, it really is. I didn't have that. Oh, I I'm here. I finally made it. I'm an astronaut. That didn't hit me until like the fourth day of the flight. That's how busy I was, and I was actually at the galley getting some, some a drink or something, and I thought about my grandmother, and she, I remember had trouble getting out of the car when she was old. She had trouble getting out of her chair. You always had to help her. Gravity was a huge deal in her life, and I thought if my grandmother could be up here, she could do everything, everything. She could be doing flips and turns and all that. And so I realized that the older you get, the easier it is to go up because you're going from gravity to zero, but the problem is coming home. It's very hard, so the older you get, the harder it is to come home because you're going from, you adapt to zero gravity and then you come back and <coughs> returning is very hard on your body because now you know you have gravity, but you know, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you're, you're like, did I grow up in all this gravity? Man, this is, this is really <laughs> terrible, you know, all the gravity I have to deal with. So, you know, I hope that answers your oh, question. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, it's, there's really like that human interest side of being in space, there's so much work going on right now on a medical and physiological side, well, psych psychologically too, of what it's like to be in that environment for long periods. Mm -hmm. so you brought up um, making a drink, and we all, uh, almost always have to ask this question. It's one of my favorite questions, but uh, I was once curator of our Apollo space food collection, and as I can see it from what we have in our um, space shuttle space food collection, Food seems to have gotten better. Did how did you find That's the good. food? Did you have a particular favorite thing to eat? Um, did you have anything in your selection that was sort of reminded you of home? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I will say the food was really good because the cooks made it for us. It was homemade, and you had two classes where you go to the food kitchen. Forgot what they called it. The galley, like the mess hall. The, yeah, yeah and galley. they would cook the food there, oh, and you okay. would taste it. You only have one taste because you had to eat, you had to do all of it. And then you'd pick your meals. And I went da da da. I remember I picked shrimp cocktail on my first, and I could not eat it in space because it made me sick when I opened it because of the smell. But I can eat it on Earth, I couldn't eat it in space. But as far as my favorite, 
I didn't want anything sweet. I just wanted salty stuff. So that like chicken and rice, chicken and vegetables, that was probably my favorite. And I forgot your last question. There was I another one in there, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I will say the the food was, there was another option. For those of you who are military, you could take the MREs, the meals ready to eat. And those had a lot of salt in them, but they were also too big. And I never ate those because on earth I could eat one, but in space you only can eat small amounts because you're gonna feel kind of sick if you eat too much. Cause you, everything's kind of floating, your stomach and your, you know, your, get the fluid shift up to your head. So you gotta kind of moderate your eating. I ended well, up losing eight pounds on my first flight. Wow. One of, one of the things that I learned in, in, in talking with Eileen was the rule on the space shuttle was if you open a package of food, somebody is going to eat everything that's in it. there yeah. because you are not going to have any leftovers because that stuff's going to get stowed under the, uh, the floor in, in the mid deck and it's going to ride there for two weeks. And it's, you can imagine if you had to keep all of your trash yeah. in your camper on the, under the floor of the camper for two weeks, what that would be like. So, it, it, it'll yeah. smell and some of the commanders said no one is allowed to take fish because that'll smell and no one is allowed to take bananas. There were certain, I didn't do that, but um, but yeah, you're right. We would, if, especially, I couldn't eat that shrimp. I gave it to Janice Boss, my crew. You, oh yeah, I'll eat it. So <laughs> you would share your food in that way. So one thing that we uh, are interested in at the museum is not only the role of the astronaut, but the role of the entire team in making spaceflight happen. That's one thing that certainly we hear a lot about are all the engineers and technicians that have to work on the entire vehicle, the launch system. Everything that goes into spaceflight has to be worked on by somebody. Um, tell us a little bit about what it means to have that big community behind you and what it's like when you're in a place they can't get to. So you're in space. What is it like to have to work with the ground, um, people on the ground? It, what do they help you with, basically? Yeah. Well, you, you're basically, trained, you've trained yeah. to do this job, but they're there to support well, you, you as well. The, the mission would not happen without the team. There's just no way. So, I mean, they are the mission. You know, they make it happen, and everybody does their little part. Of, and I think every astronaut knows that. I think when you become a commander, it becomes reinforced even more. Because as a commander, I interacted with the external, uh, you know, mission control, the engineers, Kennedy Space Center, the other centers, the pay people, like the case of Chandra, we took up the X-ray observatory on my third flight, um, the command, go into meetings. So I think I had more of a connection as the commander. And because of the responsibility that the commander has, you know, it, you know that mission is not going to happen without all the, with everybody on the team. I don't know if you want to add yeah. something from your perspective. I mean, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this too was that you connected me with your, the people who ran your training team and you talked about how, yeah. how important training was to prepare for all of this. And even, you know, the, uh, the, the um, complexities of trying to train on Earth when you're being pulled down in gravity, when you're training in the airlock and you're only you'd be able to use the bottom half of it, but you're in space now, you can use the top half of yep. that as well. But, but then everybody training on their individual tasks but then not realizing what the what the choreography was going to be like when you all got into space and were suddenly like on top of each other. It was yeah, a really and you know our training team thing. worked very very hard, and they were uniquely challenged because like back in the Air Force, our train train our instructors in the airplane they had done the mission. At NASA, the instructors had not actually been in space; they were experts in their systems. So they it, it was very challenging for them to teach us what we needed to know. So kind of the teaching went both ways. But they worked very hard, and you want to make sure, we always had to make sure that they were recognized because we couldn't do it without them. I want to remind everybody watching at home, feel free to submit your questions online. We can uh, get them here and ask uh, if we have time. And those of you in the audience here in the museum, you're more than welcome to contribute your questions using the QR code on either side of the stage. Um, I want to talk about this very large vehicle above us. You flew on Discovery twice, your first and final missions, once as pilot, once as commander. What makes Discovery different or special um, in its own way from the other orbiters? They seem to all have personalities. I, I equate it um, now to being one of my children. Um, I have two boys, and, and Discovery's kind of my third child. Um, they definitely have very different attitudes, but they can, um, they can be really feisty at the same time. Was there something about Discovery that made it special to you? Well, I, it was my first, the, f the first orbiter I flew was Discovery and also the last one I flew. And in between, I flew Atlantis and Columbia. And, you know, I would say from a pilot's point of view, the orbiters flew pretty much the same. 
What made the, them fly differently was the weight and center of gravity. So if you, for example, you had an aft center of gravity like we did with Chandra, your controls in the pitch axis were more sensitive and you're more likely to get into a pilot-induced oscillation. And then with the forward center of gravity, it was more stable. And, you know, I could go on and on, but I think those were the biggest differences. The other, but as far as the interior, Columbia had an internal airlock. The other orbiters, NASA moved the airlock out in the payload bay. And the reason they did that was so you could dock that orbiter with the Mir or the International Space Station. Columbia never docked with a space station, so they kept the airlock inside. So that was maybe the biggest difference that you could see as a person. Um, Columbia was instrumented because it was the first, so it had instrumentation under the wings, and the other orbiters did not. And Columbia was heavier because, you know, we didn't really know, so we built it sturdier, and as we got data on Columbia, they were able to more efficiently build. So I could go on. Those are just some of the examples. But I think the history, now that we look back, it's the history versus the technical differences. I think it's more the historical differences that make us identify with orbiters. So two of your flights, you visited the Mir space station. Uh, you described some of the very visceral experience of going aboard Mir as, and, and then its difference from the ISS. I want to have you describe that a little bit to our audience and just how different the Mir space station, which was the Russian uh, space station through the 80s and 90s, um, how was it different in the approach? You did a rendezvous on one mission and then you docked on another mission. Um, what was visually different? Um, and sort of what was it like going aboard a spacecraft that was not built in this country? So what are the sort of signatures of the Mir space station? Yeah, so there's a lot documented on that. I, I would say I loved being on the Mir space station. You know, it was launched, owned by Russia. They had the Russian cosmonauts there. You went into Mir, it was the most mysterious, <laughs> cool place. They had had a fire on Mir. So I docked in May of 97. They had a fire up there in, I believe it was February of 97. So the commander at the time, Vasily Sablayov, had put a red fabric, like like the yellow brick road, but it was the, like the red brick road. It was, if we have smoke, you follow this red fabric back to the shuttle. You could get lost in Mir temporarily because the, <laughs> you know, we had uh, a couple of extra modules were added, Spectre and Perota, so you get very disoriented in Mir. And the other thing about it, it was warm and it was humid. And I never thought it smelled, people, I said, does it smell bad in there? No, not really, it kind of smelled like a, like a basement, so with the humidity, but it was electronic humidity. More like, now on the space station, the International Space Station, which was new, when I went there, it was five years, five years old, it was colder. On, International Space Station. It was drier, it was brighter. Um, I think I was more familiar with the equipment because it was built by the United States. Now, the International Space Station had a Russian side also, which looked very much like Mir and much bigger. And I could, I could go on and on, but you know, we still have the cooperation with the Russians. In fact, later this month, there is a American astronaut who will launch on a Soyuz Frank Rubio, I believe, is, is going to launch. And then there is a Russian cosmonaut, a woman, who will fly on SpaceX in October. So we still have our cooperative program going on with the Russians. We try, it, we try to keep space above politics and above the problems on Earth, but we'll see how that goes. So you're an astronaut, you're flying to space, you're training. Um, I, I asked this question of um, one of your, your colleagues, Pam Melroy, before. Um, what is a day in the life of an astronaut like when you're not in space? Yeah, so the astronauts all have jobs. And when you graduate from your one year or two years, depending on, now it's a two year training program, um, you get assigned to a job in the office. Maybe you work with the robotics, you might work with uh, EVA, which is spacewalk. You know, in my case, I was assigned to orbiter systems and I worked with all the engineers on upgrades going on to the orbiter. So you're busy. Unfortunately, you, you go to a lot of meetings, you do a lot of lot depending on your job you'll do paperwork um, so th there really isn't a typical day but when you get assigned to a flight now you're into training so you have to kind of hand your job over to somebody else and you will start training but your training can be in the simulator in the t38 uh, you can be traveling to a factory somewhere to 
actually see the hardware firsthand. There's always something different. And I would say one of the hardest things about being an astronaut, and this is when you are selecting astronauts, this is very hard to evaluate in a human. But you need to be able to switch from one task to another quickly and be able to do that efficiently. And I find as I get older, it's not as easy for me to do that. When I was younger, like here I am busy doing, I don't know, pick, pick something, you know, I'm opening the payload bay doors. And then, okay, that's done. Now immediately I have to go to something else. I have to set up an experiment. And now I have to immediately go and, you know, do something else on the science. So you got to make that mental switch. And that's tough to make. And on, in the shuttle program, unlike space station today, the shuttle program, the mission was choreographed, and you had to go fast because you only had seven days, 10 days, maybe 18 days. You had to go fast and don't make a mistake. <laughs> so we trained and trained and trained. Nowadays on Space Station, if you, I mean, you still want to do things on time, but you, you're not as much of a hurry. You, can, you have more time to figure things out up there. So you know? at a midpoint in, at this, in this time, you became a mother. Did that make you a better astronaut? Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. So I flew my first flight and then my daughter was born. I flew my second flight, my third flight, then my son was born, and then I flew my last flight. And I used to tell people that my daughter, my first child, was my stress reliever. <laughs> and she was because I used to go in the office on the weekends, like all the time, and I didn't need to do that. But and I think you can overwork yourself. So I think before my daughter was born, I really overworked myself. A lot of it was being the first woman, I wanted to make sure that I was like this, knew everything. And uh, although when, when my daughter was born, I did have a study manual in one hand, pushing her in the stroller, and I'd be studying at the same time. So, and sometimes I would read, okay, sit down, I'm gonna read you a shuttle manual, you know? And so that was, instead of reading Goodnight Moon, you know, I'd read, read, you know, maybe some engineering diagram of the shuttle. I'd imagine that may have turned her off from the idea of becoming an astronaut. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't want to be an astronaut today, so I think she had enough of that. <laughs> so there's a point here, and you mentioned the birth of your son, and, and this comes at a particular point in time when you're transitioning, getting ready for um, sort of your, your final mission um, aboard STS-114. Um, but that was delayed, and Jonathan, I want to bring you back into the conversation sure. to talk a little bit about, I know you, you, wrote, you mentioned your book about Columbia. Um, talk a little bit about what's happening in this moment in sort of the early 2000s with NASA, its scheduling, its planning, that's really then putting STS-114 in a much different position for Eileen to then be a commander. Yeah, one of the things that I think a lot of us have forgotten about is when we were just starting to build the International Space Station, we were under international treaty to have the United States portion of it completed by 2004, if I recall. We had to have yep. no two in place by February 2004. That even NASA had screensavers on everybody's uh, computers that said like no two February so and so 2000 we're counting down to the days so there was a lot of pressure to try to launch the missions and then there started being um, hardware issues with uh, the, 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 flu the uh, flow liners for the engines they had to, to stand down for a couple months to do that there was this uh, uh, pesky mission STS 107 on Columbia that was getting in the way and kept getting bumped but the idea was we were going to fly STS-107, get it out of the way. Eileen was going to fly, or so STS-107 was going to land on February 1st, 2003. Yep. Eileen was going to fly six weeks later, and then you were going to retire right after that too. But, right. but the idea was get Columbia back. We're going to now convert Columbia so we can start using it for space station missions as well. But it was go, go, go to try to get as many missions flown as possible to meet that deadline by treaty. And so that's kind of the setup for what what happened. I don't know that that actually caused the accident, but I, I certainly believe it's that contributing. They, it contributed because NASA started uh, going through some of the same things we did with Challenger. With Challenger, we knew there were problems with the O-rings from the very outset. With Columbia, uh, two missions before Columbia, there had been a foam loss that actually dented part of the uh, metal strut that attached the solid rocket boosters. And that was signed off on as being an acceptable risk, even though supposedly, I mean, the, the specifications are no hardware damage, no impacts on the underside of the of the orbiter whatsoever. But it became, you know, well, we we've always survived it before. We can keep going ahead with it. Yeah, we're so. in the go mode. Yeah. 
So and then, then you fly the return to flight mission aboard uh, Discovery here, and it's really a, a big change. There's a procedural change. You talk a lot in the book about some of the technical changes that had to go, the shuttle had to go through, and you were actually originally slated to fly Atlantis, and it was turned over to Discovery because Discovery was more ready. Um, what are some of the key features of STS-114 that kind of set it apart in terms of the <coughs> process of space flight and, and how then we begin to transition to a much different uh, way of finishing up the program? It, because we're now turning a corner towards the end and looking at the end of the space shuttle program at that point. Yeah, so there were three main goals in what we call the return to flight mission. As Jonathan said, I was supposed to fly, I think it was March 5th or 6th. Of course, we had the accident. My flight's not going to happen. We did the accident investigation, then we went into what they call the return to flight mode. The three main goals to recover from the accident were number one, stop foam from falling off the fuel tank. Number two, if you have damage, let's say it does fall, if you have damage, be able to repair it. And then number three was inspect. Not necessarily in that order. How do you inspect? the underside of the shuttle, because Columbia never saw the hole. They, the crew never saw it. In fact, no one saw it. We know it was there because of the post-flight. Uh, we got the black box. We got the post-flight data. So those were the three main goals. We never actually achieved all of those to perfection. You know, we were still losing foam. Um, we didn't know how to repair every single kind of damage, but we knew how to repair certain kinds of damage. So everything revolved around that. I do want to say, thing about the, the, say something about the third, which was how to inspect. We added an extension to the robot arm, and on the end of that extension, we put two sensors and a camera, well, cameras and sensors, and we set up a procedure on flight day two to scan the entire underside to see if we had damage. And we also did this thing called a flip around maneuver as we went to rendezvous with the space station, we flipped the shuttle upside down so the crew on the station could photograph us to see if we had any damage. So those, that, that's kind of a quick answer to your question, but there were so many changes that took place, many of which the crew did not interact with. We added many, many more cameras at the launch pad, for example. So there were many changes. I felt when we agreed to go up and fly, this orbiter discovery, discovery in the summer, two and a half years after the accident, I knew that everything was not 100%, but we were good enough to go. You know, and it's interesting, I, I guess, too, is that we were thinking this, we had solved the problem with the foam falling off, and you had yep. a piece of foam that was almost as large, or maybe yep. even larger than the size that, that hit Columbia, and went just under the wing of Discovery, and was seen by yep. the cameras as you went up. And I, 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 you talked a little bit about what the mood was like on board the, uh, the shuttle after you guys got into orbit and uh, I heard about that. I mean, I just I can just imagine what was going through your yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. So we get emails. So it was flight day one before I went. I think it was before I went to bed on flight day one. I got an email from the flight director. Oh, you had a foam loss. I'm like, okay. And I continued reading, and it was the one off Columbia. I think was like two pounds, maybe two feet long, off a different area. Hmm. And the one that fell off of ours was on the other side. But we had a camera, and we saw it, and it went right underneath the wing. It did not hit us. And at the time, I'm in the go mode for the mission. It's like you're on stage, and you're doing your, if you ever were doing a theater production, you're on stage, you're doing your performance. You don't have time to think about that. I didn't really think about it till after the mission. It's like, OK, that happened. Doesn't affect us. Just keep doing the mission. But we had the following Sunday, we had the Sunday morning shows all like face the nation, you know, meet the press kind of shows, and we did all of them. That's all they wanted to know about. Oh, wow. What do you think about the foam that fell off? I'm like, I don't want to talk about that. That's for us, that's post-flight. But they, but you had, to, we had to be prepared to answer that question. And, uh, you know, because I mean, I signed off on it also. I thought it was okay, but we yeah. made a mistake there. So you spent another, about another year at NASA before retiring. Um, what's been the most rewarding aspect of your post-NASA career? The things you've gotten to do that maybe you'd wanted to do, some travel? Um, Without you know, a doubt, it's spending more time with my family. <laughs> because when we were training, I, I, was, I, I tried to make sure that my crew would be home by 6 o'clock. So they could have dinner with their family, they could, they could say goodnight to their kids, the crew members that had kids. If you don't have kids, I mean, you still, you need time to just decompress. So, um, but there was only so much of that. So I would say the first thing was really spending time with my, with my kids. The other thing that's interesting, as much as I love reading books, for 16 years, 
that I was on flying status at NASA. I read one book. And that was when I was in astronaut candidate training. It was, uh, it was a book on the Apollo. It was called Apollo Race to the Moon. And it was written by uh, engineers. And so I could see it from their side of the I never read another book, so I, I got to start reading books again. So I, was, I think that was one of the things is get back. And of course, travel, that's always, you want to be an adventurer, you want to be an explorer. So traveling is always good. Yeah. So I can't get away without, uh, with at the end, we're ending the program here shortly, but one of the things I know I have to ask about is what we thought might happen a few days ago. We thought it might happen today. Now we're hoping it happens tomorrow, and that's the, the launch of the Artemis One mission. So we're going back to the moon. Um, we're going to be spending more time in space. Um, would you want to be one of those astronauts? And what do you think it's going <laughs> to take? What's going to be different, really, for astronauts who are going on those long duration missions to the moon? Well, yeah, first of all, I'd go in a minute, without a doubt. I mean, that's what I've always, I'd go to Mars. I mean, I'd love to do any of that. But th I think the big difference is when we go back to the moon, we're going back to stay. So, you know, Apollo, we were competing with the Soviet Union. We wanted to get there first, prove that it can be done. They did a phenomenal job of that, but the program was canceled for you know whatever reason. We never made a strategic commitment to stay at the moon. We're doing that now. We're going back to the moon really for two reasons. You know, you want we want to establish space stations there to encourage private industry to follow so we can have, you know, mine the resources on the moon, you know, just kind of explore, learn what's there. The second reason, probably the most important, is we're going to Mars. And so all that equipment that will be used six months away to two years away on Mars has to be reliable. It cannot fail, especially Obviously, your propulsion systems can't fail, but your life support has to work. So we can test that out on the surface of the moon. There are some differences. You know, moon has less gravity. It has more dust. I mean, it has more radiate. I mean, there's differences. But the fact is, there are some good similarities. So your water recycling, your air recycling, all of that's got to work. So I'd say that's probably the quick answer. I don't, if you want to add anything, I was just, just flashing back. You were saying, of course, that, that she would go in a minute. We, we were together at the Astronaut Hall of Fame induction, and Artemis was on the launch pad <laughs> for, the, uh, uh, for the dress rehearsal. I have uh, one of my favorite pictures I've taken. I've got Eileen has got her nose pressed up against the window of the bus <laughs> looking, out, looking out, trying to take a picture with her cell phone camera of, of the Artemis out there. And I was just thinking, boy, I would love to see her flying on top oh. of that. Well, you know, someday they'll want to send an old lady, so I'll volunteer. <laughs> Send the old lady up. I'll be, I'll be John Glenn, but the woman version. Oh, that's a great idea. I, um, I do want to give two quick shout outs, and I apologize to those of you who've been watching at home, and I didn't get a chance to get you before, but upstate New York. So we've got some of your, oh. um, yeah, some folks from great. probably your area and Metro Atlanta. Thank you all for joining us on YouTube and all of our other networks. Um, I do want to give a couple of previews for things that are coming up. Um, so before we leave you today, I want to share a couple of things. Our se new season of STEM in 30, the museum's Emmy nominee. TV show for students will be launching their new season in September. Each 30-minute episode covers a different topic in a fast-paced, student-friendly way. Their step September episode breaks down the Drake Equation and looks at the search for extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations. In October, we'll take a look inside at the Test Pilot School. And in December, we'll have a look at the 50th anniversary of the end of the Apollo program, but also a preview of returning to the moon. And if you enjoyed the program today, be sure to follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter. And I want to thank, obviously, Colonel Eileen Collins for joining us today, Jonathan Ward, and thank all of you for joining us here in the museum and watching on home. Thank you. Ready? Stay put for a minute. What's that? You have to stay put for a minute.